Hi, my name is Chris Henretti, and I'm going to be presenting a paper on government identifiability and the number of parties. You can find links to the full text of the paper and the replication archive in the description below. I'll be making three claims. First, that we can measure government identifiability using quantities from models of coalition formation. Second, that identifiability increases linearly in the number of seat-winning parties. And finally, that this relationship is causal and that the effect is remarkably similar across different contexts. But before I make those claims, I need to define one key term. By identifiability, I mean the degree to which the party composition of the government can be predicted given the election results. Some people argue identifiability is an important part of democracy. If we can't know the likely government once the voters have spoken, well, what power do voters really have? Here's an example of high identifiability. In the 2020 elections in Trinidad and Tobago, two parties won seats and the People's National Movement won a majority of seats. In theory, there are three possible governments a single party government of the People's National Movement, a single party government of the United National Congress and a grand coalition. But you don't need to be an expert in Trinidadian politics to predict that the People's National Movement will form a single party government. It's a case of high identifiability. Here's an example of low identifiability. In the 2023 Spanish elections, 11 parties won seats and as of mid-August, no one really knows which government will form. There are certainly lots of possible governments, and generally that number, j, is equal to 2 to the power of n minus 1. In this case, that's 2 to the power of 11 seat-winning parties minus 1, giving us 2,047 possible governments. Now I've described these scenarios as high or low identifiability, but I think we can quantify identifiability using the concept of entropy. It's a concept associated with Claude Shannon, shown on the left here, and it measures the uncertainty associated with a discrete outcome. Formally, entropy is equal to minus one times the sum of the probabilities of the different exclusive events times the log of the probability of that event where the log can have different bases. If you're using log to the base 2, then entropy is measured in bits. Informally, the entropy then becomes equal to the number of maximally informative yes or no questions you would need to work out what happened. Let's calculate entropy for the traditional coin toss. We assume that the probability of heads is 0.5, the probability of tails is 0.5, and so if we follow the calculations, we can see that the entropy of a fair coin toss is 1. In other words, in order to work out what happened in a coin toss, we need to ask a single question, whether it landed heads. Now if we had a trick coin guaranteed to land heads up, then entropy would be 0. Entropy always has a lower bound of 0, making it a ratio variable. But the upper bound of entropy depends on the number of possible events. If there are j possible of events, then the maximum entropy happens when all j events are equally probable. Entropy is then equal to log to the base 2 of the number of events. The entropy for a dice throw is therefore log to the base 2 of 6, which gives just over 2.5. Entropy can only be calculated when we know the probabilities of the different discrete events. But fortunately, there's a large subfield of comparative politics which tries to model the probabilities of different coalitions forming. Most of this literature uses conditional logistic regression models. The details of those models are not that important. What is important is that these models can be used to generate predicted probabilities that each logically possible coalition will form. Intuitively, 
where the model places high probability or one or a small number of possible coalitions forming, entropy is low and identifiability is high. Where the model derived probabilities are spread out amongst many possible governments, entropy is high and identifiability is low. Here is a worked example taken from the paper which shows this for one particular coalition formation opportunity in Bulgaria. Now, so far, I've shown you that we can use models of coalition formation to calculate the entropy of coalition formation, and I've suggested that entropy can be used as a measure of government identifiability. Now I have to turn to explaining government identifiability. I'm going to do that using the number of seat winning parties. And this is the obvious explanatory variable because the number of seat winning parties sets logical bounds on values of the outcome variable. We know the lower bound on entropy, that's zero, which happens when we know exactly which government will form. But the upper bound on entropy is equal to log to the base two of the number of possible coalitions. And if we ignore corner cases, then the number of possible coalitions is approximately 2 to the power of the number of seat winning parties. But log to the base 2 of 2 to the power of some x is just equal to that x. And so the upper bound is equal to the number of parties. If we plot this, we get bounds that look like this. Of course, we don't know what the true relationship is, just that it has to respect these bounds. Maybe the true relationship looks like this, or like this. I'll argue it looks like this. And I'll argue it looks that way across parliamentary democracies, across presidential democracies, and across Swedish municipalities. In my first study, I extend Kaiser, Orlovsky and Remert's study of coalition inclusion probabilities in parliamentary democracies. I include data for 1,094 formation opportunities in 35 parliamentary democracies between 1945 and 22, using data from the well-known Parlgov project. I use Kaiser, Orlovsky and Remert's model of coalition formation I store the predicted probabilities of each coalition forming and I use this to calculate entropy. This is what it looks like when plotted against the number of seat winning parties. The solid line is a straight line and the dashed line is a local smooth. You can see that the local smooth is almost identical to the linear fit. Each additional party increases entropy by between three quarters of a bit and four fifths of a bit. Now that's just an association. But because I've got information on lots of different parliamentary democracies, including democracies where there are legal thresholds for representation, I can construct some nice counterfactuals. And indeed, using the same design as Dinas and Valentin, I can identify parties which were just above a threshold, subtract their votes until they fall below the threshold, and calculate a counterfactual seat distribution. I can then use the same coalition model I used before and recalculate probabilities and thus entropy in this counterfactual. I can then calculate the difference in entropy between what actually happened and the counterfactual with one fewer party. Averaging across all these counterfactuals, I find that the change in entropy when you knock out one party is almost exactly three quarters of a bit. In my second study, I look at government formation in Swedish municipalities. There are two reasons for this. Uh, the first is that I can replicate Kronert and Neiman's study of coalition formation, which includes uh, over a thousand formation attempts in Swedish municipalities over 20 years. The second reason, though, is that the assembly size of Swedish municipalities is dictated by certain population thresholds. And because assembly size strongly affects the number of seat winning parties, this gives me a really strong instrument for the number of parties, which is independent from the complexity of coalition formation. Here are the rules on assembly size. They're all minima 
If you exceed the population threshold on the left, you have to have at least this number of assembly seats. And here's what it looks like in practice. Population on the horizontal axis, assembly size on the vertical. If you use that relationship to run an instrumental variables regression model, this is what you get. In the first column, we had a model of the number of seat winning parties as a function of both population and thresholds. That model with thresholds fits a lot better than a model with just population, shown in column two. And so our instrument is a strong instrument. Because we've got that strong instrument, uh, we can use it to model the outcome. And so the last column shows the results of the outcome model, where as before, each additional party increases entropy by almost exactly three quarters of a bit. My final application is to cabinets in presidential democracies. In particular, I'm replicating Freud and Reich's study of cabinets in Latin American countries. You might think that cabinet formation in presidential democracies is necessarily simpler than in parliamentary democracies. Uh, we do know that the president's party is going to be part of that cabinet. Uh, and so entropy in presidential democracies is lower than the same number of seat winning parties. But the effect of an additional seat winning party is pretty similar. Once again, here's the best fitting line. And once again, an extra seat winning party increases entropy by close to three quarters of a bit. Uh, I think this is an underestimate because Freudenreich's data does exclude some smaller parties with less than 1% of the seats. I think that biases the coefficient downwards a little bit. So in this presentation, I've argued that we can measure government identifiability using entropy, which in turn is based on predictions from models of coalition formation, and that when we do this, there's a steady linear relationship between entropy and the number of seat-winning parties. This therefore connects a normatively relevant property of party systems to the seat product model. If you tell me how big your assembly is and what your average district magnitude is, I can tell you the expected number of seat winning parties and with that, how complex your government formation is likely to be. And that is, I would suggest, an important tool for institutional designers.